Good evening and welcome to the January 11th regular meeting of the City of Arcadia's Planning Commission. We're holding this meeting as a webinar in response to local efforts to reduce the spread of the COVID-19 virus. If you wish to make a public comment during the meeting, there are two ways. If you are on your computer, when the commission is discussing the agenda item on which you would like to speak, rate, uh, click the raised hand icon. When the public comment period opens and it's your turn, you'll get a notice. The clerk, the clerk will unmute you and you'll have two minutes to comment. If you're on your phone, you can also join the meeting by calling the number at the bottom, uh, calling the number and meeting ID all at the bottom of the screen. Press star nine to let the clerk know you wish to speak when the public comment period opens and it's your turn. Press star six, the clerk will unmute you and you'll hear a prompt and you'll have two minutes to speak. This meeting is now officially called to order. Director Loya, can we get a roll call please? Uh, yes, uh, uh, Chair Vasade Elcock. Here. Vice Chair Mayor. Here. Uh, Commissioner Tagney. Here. Commissioner Davies. Here. And Commissioner White. Here. Um, Commissioner White was muted, but I'll note for the record she is here. And Commissioners um, Barstow and Figueroa are not in attendance at this time. Oh, here comes Commissioner Barstow. So Commissioner Figueroa is not in attendance at this time. Okay, and at the staff table, we have um, Director of Community Development, David Loya, and is there anyone else, any other staff? Uh, yes, we'll have uh, Senior Planner Dee Freitas and uh, Deputy Director of Community Development, Jennifer Dart. Okay, good. Okay, so let's move on to oral communication. This time is provided for people to address the commission or submit uh, written communication on matters not on this evening's agenda. Um, any request that requires commission actions will be set by the commission for a future agenda or referred to staff. Is there any member of the public who would like to um, address us on something that's not on the agenda? I know our Zoom uh, has been a little slow lately, so I'm gonna give just a moment for folks to uh, raise their hands if they choose to. I'm not seeing any. Okay, um, on the consent calendar, the only items we have are the October 26th and the December 14th, 2021 uh, minutes. Does anyone need to pull either of those items or can we get a motion to approve those two items? Can someone make a motion to approve the, the last two minutes? I'll, I'll move to approve the uh, items on the consent agenda. Okay, we have a first by Commissioner Barstow. Do we have a second? I'll second that. Second by Commissioner Tang. Can we get a roll call, please? Commissioner Barstow? Aye. Commissioner Tagney? Aye. Commissioner Davies? Aye. Commissioner White? I, I was also absent on the 14th. You uh, you can abstain if you wish, but you can also, because it's procedural, uh, vote to accept the minutes into the record. Aye. Uh, Vice Chair Mayor? Aye. And Chair Vasade Alcock? Aye. A motion approved. So tonight we have one public hearing to consider this evening. This is one we've seen before. It's resolution PC 21-08, amending the Housing for Homeless Combining Zone allowing um, permanent supportive housing at two locations in Valley West. Um, but before we open this, do we have any ex parte communications to disclose? Judith? Uh, yeah, um, uh, three different people contacted me um, over the past week to um, talk about this by phone or email. Um, and I, I um I don't recall their names, which I'm I'm apologizing about. Um, but I just did want to 
disclose that. Um, yes. Okay, thank you. So before we ask for a staff report, this, this one's a little bit different because I guess I have a question for the commission. Um, based on the council's actions on January 5th, you know, this is pretty much resolved. It's kind of a done deal. Um, the council's already taken action. We're only seeing it because this is a procedural issue. It, it you know, we we were gonna we're continuing it. We agreed to, but in the meantime, it got approved. So I guess I'd like to hear from the commission on how we'd like to move forward. Do we even want a staff report? Um, do we want to just open it for public comment for anybody that is tuning in deliberately to comment on this? Or how do we want to handle this, commissioners? Commissioner Davies? I mean, I feel personally like we spent a really a, a, a lot of time discussing this. And as you mentioned, since um, subsequent to our two meetings thus far that we've spent discussing it, the council's passed it, I'm ready to move on from this issue myself and spend our time uh, attending to other commission items. Does anyone else want to comment on that? Or do you agree with Davies, uh, Commissioner Tagney? I just want to agree with Scott on that. Uh, Vice Chair Mayor. Uh, yeah, I, I, I would like to not move to the point where the commission would need to vote on this um, action since the council has already in, in effect preempted that vote. But I would like to hear from um, community director Loya about how the the um, whole picture had addressed some of our concerns um, before we actually move on. So I, I, I would like that staff report, um, but I, I don't see a need for the Planning Commission to take action on this item. Uh, um, uh, Commissioner White, did you have your hand up? I was just going to say if there was a member from the public who came to address this, that we might give them the opportunity. And I concur also that um, I don't see any reason for us to spend a whole lot of time on this. Director Loya, do we have members of the public who would like to speak on this issue? Um, no one has raised their hand yet, but if anyone is here to speak on the Housing for Homeless Combining Zone uh, Amendment, uh, if you'd please raise your hand now. I believe the Planning Commission is moving towards allowing you to speak. And um, if you want, I can give sort of the, you know, high level synopsis, uh, 45 seconds or less on, um, you know, how the council addressed some of the concerns that came up during the study session. I, I think that would be a good idea just for anyone who's watching. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> and you, you, you know, I think Commissioner Davies hit the nail on the head. There was copious co public comment. I don't see anything coming up now. And so, um, you know, commission certainly under no obligation to take public comment on this. Um, the council did based on, you know, some information we received from uh, our partners at housing community development, that's HCD. Um, as well as analysis from uh, the city attorney that the um, uh, proposed changes as we understood them based on the, uh, the study session couldn't be adopted into the ordinance the way that it was currently structured, um, but that uh, we could incorporate some of the concerns that were raised, in particular the, the need for ongoing uh, you know, public outreach uh, and access to the public to um, uh, you know, to make modifications uh, to ensure that the, you know, that uh, low income projects, in particular, you know, those that are serving uh, homeless uh, have access to those, the, um, the operations. And so uh, what we had proposed was to bring the term sheet back for these two projects and incorporate, they include some kind of ongoing outreach and engagement with the community and address community concerns as they're raised. Um, and so we'll be incorporating that into the loan terms as opposed to incorporating it into the land use uh, requirements. 
Um, and there were some, you know, very technical nuances due to the way that our current ordinance is structured um, that uh, prevented a wholesale um, uh, inclusion of some sort of provision uh, and we in, into the land use. And so we, we can come back and talk about that at another time and, and look at, you know, if there's ways to restructure uh, those underlying ordinances and whether the, you know, the commission has the desire to do that. So that's, I think, around 45 seconds. Any follow-ups for com Commissioner Tegney? Yeah, um, Director Loya, on the facility operating standards, it um, outlines that um, it'll be up, the up to the community development director to be the review authority on that, but that these mm -hmm. standards that appears as though they need to be a written document. And I'm just wondering if that's something that, you know, at what stage in the process does that get fleshed out? Um, that's a really good question. Um, typically for a project that's being funded in co coordination with the city, um, that authority is actually directed through the, um, the approval process for the loan agreement. If you look at the two projects that we just approved, the, the uh, city council authorized the community development, development director to approve the affordable housing plan, which is essentially the operations plan. Um, they approved the city attorney to draft the loan documents and they approved the city manager to execute any loan documents or grant documents necessary to, to accomplish the projects. And so that is a written uh, document that usually gets generated because there's, you know, there's a lot of information that goes into it that isn't known until you know what your funding sources is and what the requirements of those different funding sources. So that usually gets that document usually gets drafted pretty close to the time when we close on the loans. Um, so what what I'm proposing, uh, what we propose to the council uh, moving forward, if these projects come forward um, and they have a loan component, that we would actually include a draft of the operations plan or the affordable housing plan um, at the front end, but just acknowledging that you know the the staff, the you know professional staff that are um, you know going through and negotiating the, the loan terms with various other uh, funding entities and um, you know the requirements that are baked into those other funding entities, we have to have the latitude to be able to make decisions about what gets included and what doesn't get included, um, you know, ultimately. And so we would use this early approval process to share, you know, generally broad brush strokes, what's going to be included in the operations plan in the future. Uh, if, if nothing else changes about the ordinance, this is new practice is that we would bring forward an early draft of the operations plan so that the public, the decision makers can see that. And then ultimately those, those affordable housing plans don't get a, adopted until we're ready to f finalize the loan documents and the, the regulatory agreements. Um, as a follow-up, uh, it feels as though that's the elephant in the room on this topic that um, the letters that we re have received, many of them and min many of the public who spoke are concerned about just how this is going to bleed over into the neighborhood. And as I look down the list of the facility operating standards, there's things like case management, uh, client services, behavioral guidelines, parking, emergency plan security, some of those things, if those are going to be in that document, that's not going to come up for a while. Um, it feels like that's the main part that everybody kind of needs to see. And um, just to be transparent as a um, city, uh, the agencies involved, it sure feels like that information, the sooner that gets out and is very public, the better. I'm sure it's complicated to come up with that whole document, but it is the part that I hear a lot of people very concerned about. Um, everybody it's wants- It's really important. But how's it gonna bleed over? Yeah, it's, yeah, no, and I get that. Um, it's really important to understand that the, the likelihood, so first off, we're talking about only the parcels that are designated in the housing for homeless combining zone. So it's only those 10 parcels or so. And it's only the projects that, um, you know, don't have any kind of city funding, which that's an infinitesimally small number. In fact, we have zero at this point uh, that would qualify uh, in that, that um, pathway. Um, so it's, it's a very rare occurrence, but you know, I know that a lot has been made about this authority being delegated to the, the director of community development. 
Um, the reality is that you know authorities are delegated to to staff level positions all the time. Um, that especially with the ministerial review, it's it's the way that the city functions um, when you're doing a ministerial review. And there's a real difference between you know projects that are uh, authorized under you know either a quasi -judici judicial approval process where you know the planning commission and maybe the city council are holding public hearings and taking input. This law actually requires that we have a ministerial pathway. Now, based on the concerns that we heard, the the uh, you know the information that came in from the community, we created this secondary pathway that allows us to explore these um, uh, you know these various features, the items in the security plan, security plan, the management plan, all those things, through the the funding pathway. So we've we've got a strategy to try and accomplish what it is that we're concerned with the community, raised as concerns for the the commission. Um, and, you know, based on that very limited number of sites where, you know, this would be allowable, you know, as a, as a principally permitted pathway, as a non-discretionary pathway, um, there's actually very, very little um, likelihood that these projects would come forward and have no, no public review in the first place. And in the second place, um, you know, it's only on a very limited number of parcels, so. I, you know, I, I don't, I understand the concern, but I guess it's, the, it's, I don't know how well placed, um, you know, the energy is because it's just so unlikely that we'd ever get into a situation where there's zero review. The other thing uh, to, that's important to note is that those items that the state law um, lists that we've incorporated into our list, those are, those are established in state law. They say these are the only standards that you can use. And they were specific to emergency shelters. These are the only standards you can use. Um, and, they, and it has to be a ministerial process. You can't require them to do anything that, you know, non-ministerial or that um, any other ministerial process wouldn't do. Um, and so, you know, so adding to that list or, um, you know, creating new processes in that list would be in violation of the state law that, um, and would put us at risk of, um, you know, litigation for for not being compliant with that state law. So I think, you know, the the limited nature of this application is really what's important. And I think, you know, Vice Chair Mayor and I had a conversation the other day and, uh, you know, she has some ideas about how to change the multifamily regulations that, you know, we can certainly bring up over the course of the next, um, you know, several meetings, especially as we're starting to dig into the, you know, the gateway plan and, and what requirements might be need to be met for, you know, those types of developments. Any other questions? Yes, thank you. And I just really want to emphasize that what I'm talking about here, just two properties that are furthering this whole topic. And um, it's really the behavioral guidelines. Um, I, I had a hard time following your answer, um, but how this these properties interface with those neighbors directly is, I think, the area of concern that it comes up again and again on this one. So um, when yeah. and where we can see those guidelines will be a very big curiosity to this project or and to this neighborhood. So yeah, before we leave this topic, I just wanna be really, really clear that the state law does not allow us to have any standards that are above and beyond any other multifamily housing type or permanent supportive housing. The ordinance as it was drafted um, made a change to ensure that it was clear that behavioral guidelines, operation standards, those kinds of things, um, you know, security, those aren't required of any other kind of multifamily housing. They're not required of permanent supportive housing either. That's a state law, it's required, and we're not gonna force them to do it. What we will ask them to do through the loan agreements though, is to ensure that there's ongoing community engagement so that the community, the neighborhood, has the ability to engage with the, the project component, the project proponents, as well as the city and say, hey, this thing isn't working for us because of X, Y, or Z, how do we work on these? Both project proponents said that they were open to that and that they were more than willing to include that as parts of their project. Thank you for that clarity, David. Anyone else? Oh, Commissioner White. Um I was just trying to understand. So 
the loan itself will be the portion that will allow the community engagement. That's correct. Is that how I'm understanding that? It'll be incorporated as a loan term, yeah, so that we require them to have that uh, ongoing engagement in the community. So what would facilitate that process? Say, for example, um, the community maybe had a suggestion or a concern or even like we really like that idea. How would they begin that engagement process? Would they go through community development or would they go directly to the program managers? What would that look like? Yeah, I don't have the details before me right now. Again, none of this has been developed, but it's going to be a process that the management uh, team of the facility facilitates. And so they would be, you know, creating those forums uh, to allow people to, you know, participate. Any other questions? Or is there any member of the public who has a question? No. Nobody has raised Vice a hand yet. Vice Chair Mayor. Yeah, um, there there are a number, there are a few places in the um, H, H combining zone um, ordinance, which the city council adopted um, that that indicate that there would be some sort of objective um, feasibility standards, um, presumably developed by the community development office. And I'm wondering if you can explain the process for developing those standards, which would apply um, to these two um, projects as they go forward and whether um, there would be any information available to the public as those standards are being developed. So the majority of the standards are actually embedded in the uh, ordinance itself, the existing ordinance, not the ordinance changes. The you know security and lighting and all those standards are included in the ordinance. There are some that are not <clears throat> included explicitly and what the state law says and what we tried to include not verbatim, but the um, the sense of in this ordinance revision is that if it is an emergency shelter, then those uh, feasibility criteria would be based on, you know, is it feasible and practical to to implement this? The reason why the state uh, required that these standards be uh, ministerial and objective is so that jurisdictions couldn't prevent emergency shelters from operating within their boundaries, even in these new zones based on, you know, requiring infeasible measures. And so um, essentially what we would have to do is as a staff is for if they presented something and it, um, you know, for example, for security, if they came forward with a security plan and said, you know, we're going to have a security uh, person there, you know, one day a week, we would say that's not sufficient, doesn't meet the objective. There has to be someone there 24 seven. And if they showed us that 24 seven security coverage, uh, wasn't feasible, didn't, you know, wasn't operationally feasible based on their, their financial models, then we might have to get into a negotiation and figure out what is feasible. Um, but the standards, you know, lighting, gathering, all those things that are the primary features that are in the, that list are already embedded in the ordinance. And so we're not developing anything uh, in terms of, you know, creating new standards or they're already in the ordinance. Anything that's related to, uh, you know, uh, another housing type, so a transitional shelter, for example, if someone's operating a transitional shelter, they come forward, they show us the plan sets, and they're proposing to do that in a house, single family standalone house, or maybe a single family with an ADU. We would look at the single family standalone ADU requirements in the code, everywhere else in the code, and we would apply those standards to the transitional shelter. That's what the state law tells us we have to do, and that's how we would do it. Um, so this is this is what I mean by a ministerial decision. There's there's nothing um, really um, uh, you know th there's no big decisions that are being made here. There's nothing um, you know really outside the box. These are all baked into the code already. They're either building code standards or they're zoning code standards that we can look to and say, does your project conform to these? With the exception of you know for example the you know the lighting requirements and the and the security. 
So they, long story short, they would all have to be based on some objective standard that's already in a code somewhere or feasibility. You can demonstrate that it's feasible. Any further questions? So what's the procedure on, on this item, David? Because we don't have anything to approve, right? To make a motion well, this was a public, what? Right. This was a public hearing item um, that was continued to this meeting. And so if the commission wished to, they could adopt the resolution, making a recommendation that they that the council you know, adopt this, this ordinance. You can make changes, you know, this is the range of, of options here. You can make changes to the ordinance and then adopt the resolution, or you could just close the hearing item, recognizing that the decision's already been made by the council. Yeah, maybe a motion to um, close this public hearing item due to, it's already been approved by the city council. I would like to make that motion, given the fact that the council's already taken action. I would like to make a motion that we close this item and move on. Okay, we have a first by Commissioner Davies. Do we have a second? I'll second that. Second by Commissioner Barstow. Can we have a roll call? Uh, yeah, Commissioner Davies. Aye. Commissioner Barstow. Aye. Commissioner White. Aye. Commissioner Tegney. Aye. Uh, Vice Chair Mayor. Aye. And Chair Vasid Alcock. Aye. All right, so our next is we have business items. So the first business item is the draft gateway area plan. Um, I Do the commissioners have any, are we gonna get a staff report on that? Or are you just at, looking for specific questions? Um, do you have a staff report? Yeah, I have a brief okay. staff report, um, if you'll indulge me. Um, okay, let me share screen here. Okay, first, you know, I just I want to recognize that, you know, there we're always, uh, we're like a snowball. We're constantly gathering new place people to this effort. Um, and so I just want to refresh folks on how to get involved, how to stay up to date as to what's going on with the infill redevelopment program and uh, a little bit about how to um, how to get engaged. Let me update this page here. Um, for one thing, um, I just want to recognize our fantastic community development staff who've been really working really hard to try and make this page more useful. We've been getting feedback from the public on you know the organization and the usefulness of this page and so uh, you know, we tried to respond and modify um, as we will continue to do so throughout the, the engagement process. Um, and so folks out there in TV land, um, you know, tell us what you think of our new page. If you Google Arcata and SIRP, S-I-R-P, that Strategic Infill Redevelopment Plan, the very top hit is going to be the page we were just on. Uh, this has all the information about content that has been created, talks about what is ill, uh, infill, what the SERP is, the gateway plan, what the general plan is, so on and so forth. Importantly, what, I'm, what I wanna to point to here is the how do I get involved? And so uh, a couple of primary ways to get involved. One is to uh, sign up for e-notifications. If you go to the sidebar here, e-notification sign up, you click on that link, uh, you'll get to a page eventually. It looks like this. And you wanna sign up for this long range planning and community visioning. We'll send out notifications to updates to the plan. We'll send out notifications around when we're having engagements. And we're looking forward to a couple of uh, really cool engagements coming up in January and February. Um, the first is that um, the, you'll see on this upcoming presentations to city committees, uh, January 11th, we're, that's today, we're doing this uh, planning commission hearing. Uh, on the 18th next week, we'll be at the Transportation and Safety Committee. Now, in these committee meetings, when we start having the committee meetings, we're really going to try and dig into, you know, some of the technical details. So, if you're if you're a transportation wonk, or or you're, you know you're interested in alternative transportation, or you're concerned about crossings and intersections, come to the Transportation Safety Committee meeting. We'll be talking about that, and again, there'll be open format, so a lot of discussion to answer your questions. Um, and then we'll be going to the Historic Landmarks Committee uh, on the 20th. 
And then we're going to start hitting the rest of the committee meetings uh, coming up in February. And then also notably, uh, and not on the top of the list here, but if you follow the how do I get involved, we'll make sure this gets updated as well. We're going to be having an in-person open house plan for January 21st and 22nd at the Arcata Community Center. Information is on the website here for uh, dates and times. We've heard a lot of people say, hey, look, I just can't participate on Zoom, I don't have access, you know, this is difficult for me, I'm challenged because of this out of the other to be able to engage with you, I want other forms. We're struggling right now with COVID uh, and this Omicron thing is just going completely off. And so we're providing this open house as a way to really spread out the number of people that will be in the room at any given time. We'll have a lot of uh, self-guided stations that folks can go to and interact with the material and provide feedback. We'll be bringing that feedback back to the decision makers. And so this is a great opportunity if you haven't yet had a chance to participate because you're um, not on Zoom, or if you know someone who's not on Zoom, please let them know the 21st and 22nd. Uh, we'll be holding an open house. It'll be staffed by a staff member who can answer your questions about the gateway plan, and we'd love to see you there. Um, and again, the community vision survey is still open. Please take that if you haven't taken it yet. So that's how to get access to information about the plan itself and how to get involved with the ongoing engagement. Um, again, the plan is available on our website. Um, and what I've got tonight is a, let's see, got for you tonight, is a little bit of a choose your own adventure. And so really I like to, you know, follow the lead of uh, planning commission you know, the, the draft has been out since the uh, 1st of December. And, you know, we've had several walking tours. Um, we've had several, you know, stakeholder meetings. We've had, uh, you know, various types of engagements. Uh, what we haven't had yet is a real in-depth dive into, you know, questions that the Planning Commission may have. Now, we're not looking for a solid recommendation tonight. In fact, we strongly urge you not to set too in entrenched an idea as to what you think your recommendation ought to be. Um, we want you to make sure that you hear from the community, that you hear the, the public engagement, that you have time to ruminate on this. But we do have time tonight and an opportunity to, um, you know, either, you know, at the, at the Planning Commission's, uh, you know, desire, we can either open it up and hear a question and answer from community, or if the Planning Commission already has a set of questions and you want to dig into this document, you want to look at the policy language, or like, why did we, you know, do X, Y, or Z on, you know, mobility? Um, the night is yours. You tell us what to do. I've got the document here. I've got all of the uh, various sections of it page marked here. We can talk about any section of it, the plan relationship, how do the nuts and bolts work, uh, you know, what was the inspiration, you know, uh, looking at opportunity sites, how do those work, uh, how does the community benefits program work, if that's of interest to you. And then each of the various topics, housing, employment, arts and open space, mobility, street design, uh, street map book, which is an expansion of the street design. It's really interesting. It explodes the views of the streets, so you can take a look at those. Uh, design, historical resources, and infrastructure. So the last thing I will say is that, you know, right now we're in a heavy-duty um, engagement mode. We're, we're trying to get out as many different types of engagements as possible. Uh, we'll be bringing that you know, the results from that engagement back to the Planning Commission, the Council, for them to, you know, provide us guidance sometime early in the spring so that we can start working on some of the more detailed uh, zoning amendments. Um, and so I guess, you know, with that, I want to open the floor for uh, my colleagues, uh, Senior Planner Freitas or um, Deputy Director Dart. Wait. Try to lay it in. I'm going to try and let you in again. Um, if you have anything else to add, and then other than that, you know, I'd love to just, um, you know, follow the follow the lead of the the commission. Yep, I don't have anything to add. I'm excited to hear what you guys think about the document so far. Thank you. Do we have any members of the public who have questions or? We have several uh, names in the attendees list that I recognize. So are you hoping to open this to I think, the public? Yeah, I think so. Before we start asking our questions, let's let the public go, go first. Okay. It's a great, great approach. 
So if you have questions, comments, uh, things you wish the Planning Commission to uh, you know, dig into, you can raise your hand, use the raise hand function, and we will invite you in to speak. All right, we have our first taker. Hi, Go can ahead, you hear Betsy. me okay? We can, thank you. Okay, um, hi, uh, my name is Betsy Elkington and I teach at Redwood Coast Montessori, um, at which um, our new high school campus is located in the 10 pin building, so kind of right in the heart of this um, project. And I wanted to, I having a little bit of trouble kind of navigating um, some of the online resources and the maps, but I'm, we're, you know, we're building this um, community garden just across the bike trail from um, ours, from the 10 pin building. And I'm really interested in um, the sort of role of the green spaces and, and how those will be um, accessed by the community. Um, if you could speak to that um, a little bit in, you know, a little bit more depth, that would be really helpful, I think, as we're visioning potentially what this community garden could become um, if it's, I don't even know if it's really um, able to be in the plan, but I'm hopeful um, for our school and for the community that it will be able to be there. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, and just a, a quick uh, process question for our chair, um, typically on uh, discretionary decisions or, or typically when you open public comment you have a, a time limitation did you want to set one for tonight or oh yes I'm sorry this is a little different um yeah I would say two minutes or okay um is there anyone else who wishes to speak at this point or okay uh go ahead Chris uh, hello. Am I am I coming through okay? Yep. We hear you loud okay. and clear. So, um, yeah, it's, I've been working with a, a bunch of citizens and listening to everybody's plans and desires and you know concerns and watching it all sort of. But it seems like things are going pretty well on both ends. Um, the biggest concern I would say that I've found in my own research is the whole concerns about the infrastructure constraints with this proposed growth, uh, especially considering HSU's plans for expansion and increased enrollment. Uh, specifically, the wastewater treatment processing plan, even with the proposed upgrades that are coming in the future, are limited. You know, we're looking at maybe an additional 20% of treatment capacity in phase one and two you know, at the price tag of 90 million or whatever that the, the documents are saying, but that, that only gives us another 3,500 uh, people, you know, or units that we can provide service for. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at that as a, as a plan to try to deal with this as it's all unfolding, you know, and then we've also got the global warming and the necessity of possibly moving the plant down the road in another 30 to 50 years anyway, or adding another facility. So yeah, I'm looking at the planning and thinking we need to look further down. And, you know, the, I know we only have two minutes, so I'll, I'll follow up with, uh, I'd like to hear more about the conversations for planning and cohesion and the limitations that need to be placed on HSU's expansion plans, as well as Arcata's development plans for the next, you know, seven, 10 years, 20 years, however long it takes for this to play out. But anyway, thank you for the opportunity to speak. And uh, that's all I have for tonight. All right, thanks a lot, Chris. Um, let's see, we have community group. All right, we can hear you now. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, we can barely hear you, but we'll, we'll uh, fix that. We're actually a group of the community and um, we have um, definitely some questions, concerns, 
So we've been knocking on doors. So um, as we knock on doors, we're really realizing that there is a vast minor majority of the people that still don't know about the Gateway District plan. So we've been asking questions and um, trying to get their input on what their concerns are and um, trying to get them to read the draft. And the ones that are familiar with it, their, their concerns are definitely the size and the scale of this, the, um, the heights of the buildings, the, um, the traffic is a huge one that people, uh, that um, just the parking for, I guess, more of the parking. Um, I've been talking with the light indus industry um, folks that own their businesses and been in the community forever. And um, they are very, very concerned um, and a little upset. Um, there's a lot of concerns about um, what this will do to our infrastructure um, and um, they, uh, especially the treatment plant um, and the environment, the wetlands. Um, there's, um, so I could continue, but um, I just think that, yeah, I know you guys are working on, you know, outreach and that's great. Um, but uh, I think think there's a lot of the under planning of this that people are confused by, um, confused by. So I think we would like more answers on exactly um, where the studies are and where we've come to this um, decision as a city to go this huge and this large and have this much impact in so many different ways on our community. So, um, so as, as a group and I'm, I think I'm speaking for the majority of the people that I've talked to. Um, um, I would, I would love, <laughs> I I would love to have you guys do that outreach even more so because the public is telling me a completely different story than what I'm hearing from the city staff. So, anyways, thank you for listening and listening to a lot of the concerns yep. of the doors I've been knocking on. Um, looking forward to working with you all in the future. Thank you. Great, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate the work that you're doing individually to help spread the word. Um, definitely uh, networking is part of our, uh, you know, our, our messaging campaign. Um, and so if you uh, are a member of a group, please share it with your group. Again, I'll just put out there that, you know, our city staff are more than welcome, uh, more than willing rather uh, to attend a neighborhood meeting, um, you know, community meeting, a church group meeting, a rotary meeting, whatever your group is, we're, we'd love to come and talk to you and answer your questions. Um, and so that's uh, definitely an important part of this conversation. Uh, go ahead, Ann. Okay, am I, can you hear me? Yeah, welcome. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Ann King-Smith. I was on the planning commission when the general plan was developed. I have um, a number of issues that I'd like the planning commission to look at. If I were on the planning commission, this is what I, a few things that I would be interested in. And I think one of the things that should be included, one of these is a, to be included in the gateway plan is um, a discussion of how we got to the number 3,500 units, what 3,500 units recommend would represent in terms of the percentage of increase in population of Arcata? What about infill in other areas of the city? What proportion is Humboldt State going to take on in terms of units? And I think that the context for this plan, how it came about, is missing from the plan for those of the people that haven't been involved in either the housing element or the infill um, plan that you uh, that you uh, contracted for. The other thing it, it sort of comes across is we've got to get this done, but it's also noted that we haven't met the population increase predicted by the general plan, and yet we're going ahead and we're doing even more, even though we haven't met that increase. And so I think people need to step back and look at this and say, is this really the scale that we need to go? In terms of that, I think that I would recommend, and I hope the planning commission recommends that we stay within the general plan and limit the number of stories to four stories, which is what the general plan recommended. 
five, six, seven, eight stories is simply not appropriate for Arcata. It's not appropriate for the county that we live in. And um, uh, the business of allowing extra stories to be purchased essentially by wealthy developers by getting amenities is a method that I've never even heard of and seems un inappropriate. The amenities that are listed for the most part should be requirements for any project. And the last thing I'd like to ask the commission to consider is the um, form-based and streamlined development standards where essentially you, you think you can get enough standards so you can have ministerial approval of projects, which means there's no public input, there's no planning commission review, there's no city council review, and you're getting a cookie cutter to try and get projects, which does streamline them, but then you're not doing planning and you're not learning and we're not getting the sort of um, organically and I'm, developed. And I'm Sorry, I just was going to ask for you to wrap up your comments. It's a little over two minutes at this point. Done. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Greg, go ahead. You can unmute, Greg. There, how's that? It's great. We can hear okay, you now. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, yeah, I want to. Um, no I want to second Ann King Smith's comments. Uh, I think that, in particular, one of the things we're looking at is uh, other, uh, you know, GPU updates, if you will, in other areas of the city. And uh, it, we do need to know whether uh, there is any planning for that type of thing going on right now. And if so, then uh, CEQA, I think, would require that uh, those are noted. Uh, and what the uh, conversation is right now at the city. Uh, also, uh, we are looking at the um, Hubble Bay Sea Level Rise Adaptation Plan. Um, and this is nascent for us. We're just starting to kind of dig in here. Um, but preliminarily, it does look like um, there will be saturation levels uh, in the lower parts of this plan area where uh, the eight story buildings are being planned. Uh, and that does not seem appropriate um, in terms of really uh, preparing for sea level rise and climate change adaptation. Uh, I think that you really start need to be looking at higher ground. Uh, another thing that's concerning is, and you know, this may be off the mark here, but I, I really don't think so, is that coincidentally, the college needs about 10,000 more beds. And, and at the same time, the city is planning 10,000 more beds. So I do think, as, as Ann uh, mentioned, we need to know more about the uh, state's uh, involvement with the city, the conversation that the state and the city it, um, is having over these types of issues. Uh, I think the city should be releasing documentation uh, that um, has been uh, traded, you know, information traded back and forth, conversations with state officials. Uh, what is the state planning for us? Uh, we really deserve to know. Um, the, also, the previous community group uh, representative uh, really hit hit the mark when people just don't know this is happening. They're going door to door. The city needs to be going door to door, at least with a mailer to every um, address with all the information. And here's how to participate, that kind of thing. You know, people are very busy. And the last thing I'll say, and there's a lot more than this, uh, a lot of problems with this plan, um, is that unless the city really gets its act together prior to even beginning this type of process with traffic and the impacts of the automobile and limiting automobile access to areas and the ability to speed on our roads, uh, then the, this will be a major fail uh, because Arcata will become unlivable with the cars. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, I am not seeing any other hands uh, right at this minute. Okay, thank you. Um, oh, we got a couple more. Oh, that pop okay. We Let's got a couple more that popped up. Sorry. Go ahead, uh, Jim. Hi, uh, thanks, David. Um, I'm going to hit again on the Marsh treatment plant because I think it deserves discussion. 
the Arcata Marsh treatment plant is due for repairs and upgrades. Phase one has yet to begin. The phase would mostly just address the present demand. Uh, the gateway plan calls for 3,500 new housing units, more than likely a population increase of 7,000 people. This does not include the first floor commercial facilities, which would add additional plumbing fixtures. In addition, HSU is planning a number of housing units. Also, in August 10th planning meeting, uh, Director Lawyer explained that the gateway will be the template for additional arcade developments, combined possibly an additional 5,000 more housing units or more. Um, how is the city planning to address the increase in the treatment demand when it has yet to address the present needs as far as what's going on with the repairs presently on the on the treatment plant? Uh, thanks. That'll be it. All right. Thanks a lot, Tim. Um, and we have a uh, call-in user with uh, ending 7559. Hi, this is Connie Stewart. Um, first of all, I, I'm here speaking as a resident of Arcata, but I do have to say that no, I do work at Humboldt State University, and no one has had a conversation about building 10,000 units. Um, so that's an incredible exaggeration on what we're talking about. And the other thing I should mention is that Humboldt State is actively looking at putting units in other communities, not just in Arcata. Now, let me just say, um, as a former city council member, I want to say that as I listen to conversations about housing, I feel like I made a critical mistake. Um, you know, we had a philosophy of protecting uh, the green belt around Arcata. We never wanted Arcata to grow beyond its um, current um, zone um, and the the trade off we always made was we knew we were going to have to grow up. Now, how high we grow, I'll leave that to the planning commission. But we always knew that we were going to promote infill, and so um, it's paid me um, over the past twenty years to listen to conversations. Um, I feel like it's reneging on the deal that we made when we created the green belt around the city. Um, we need to have infill. I'll leave it to the Planning Commission to determine that. Um, as a housing justice person, I can say that I feel like liberals in the community have really helped exacerbate um, housing crisis for working families and that Arcata needs to do its share, not just for low income people, but also for working families. Nurses and firefighters deserve to be able to live in, in the community in which they work. And so I, I do want to say that I'm proud of the city for having this conversation and, um, and I support um, a robust conversation that leads to affordable housing in the region for working families. And, um, and I'll just stop there. I thank you all for your service. It's not easy. I was on the planning commission. It is not easy to be there. Um, but I hope that you make a decision um, that it will allow working families to live in Arcata. Right. Thank you. Okay. We're, we're also we're seeing another gap in hand, so um, nothing, nothing raised right now. Okay, so any member of the commission have any feedback for David and Delo? I can't see everybody. I have a question. Uh, Commissioner. Okay. Oh, there we go. Commissioner Tagney. Yeah, thank you. Um, David, I don't know at what stage in the process engineering challenges to all of this um, start to get resolved. Um, one I heard recently on a radio interview with an engineer was uh, about depth of foundation in these um, bay land, you know, lacking any kind of rocky substrate um, could be cost prohibitive. And I, I don't know if you're running into that, if those kind of conversations have started to occur. Um, it, it, you know, how many stories can you go up before 
there's just some engineering realities that start to weigh in and reduce the uh, height of eight stories down to wherever the affordable level is. And I'm not asking for an answer, but I'm just really wondering between that and all the stuff that comes up about uh, sewage treatment plant and stuff, when do engineering studies about this project start to occur? That's, that's a really uh, great question, uh, Commissioner Tagney, and, and we've definitely heard it from the community um, about a range of different infrastructure types. Um, the, you know, this planning document is, is high level, it's policy level, it's intended to set the stage for implementation. So this document is not responsible for identifying engineering level detail on specific development projects that would happen at the building permit stage. Um, but the document does need to lay out the framework uh, for the future vision for all of these different uh, areas, uh, you know, land use, housing, employment, et cetera. And so with respect to infrastructure, you know, certainly the size of the infrastructure, the types of infrastructure needs are highly dependent on the size of the community that's planned. And so to plan the infrastructure and present that in this document before we've even had the community conversation about how high are the buildings going to be, how dense are the buildings going to be, what are the land use restrictions going to be, would be putting the cart before the horse. We have to understand what we're building to before we can start those engineering plans. And I'll point to uh, you know, recent implementation of our general plan 2020 uh, that was you know, a game changer for, for the community, uh, you know, complete uh, change in, in circulation patterns and access and, and movement throughout the city was the extension of Foster Avenue. The extension of Foster Avenue was envisioned and considered uh, in 99 and, you know, or in the late 90s. And it was incorporated in the general plan update in, in 2000. And it wasn't built until 2017, 2018. I can't remember exactly when that, that project was built. So almost a 20 year time frame. Um, and you can imagine if we had done real detailed uh, designs based on, you know, whatever we knew in 1999, they would have been completely obsolete when we actually went to build them in, in 2017. And so the level that this document is hitting, what we're trying to attempt to do with this document is to identify the desired future conditions. Once we've gone through the process, the public engagement and have incorporated that, decision makers have said, yes, this is our future Arcata. Then depending on you know, various thresholds, various triggers, when those pieces of infrastructure might be needed. And they're gonna be highly dependent on how quickly we grow, how, how robustly this program um, you know, gets built out. That at those stages, those pieces of infrastructure would be required. Some are gonna be needed early on. You, know, you, can't, um, you, know, you can't buy just a portion, for example, of uh, you know, water tank. You have to buy the whole thing. And so right now, based on our current need, we're planning to install an additional water tank um, to, to service what we call zone one, which is a large part of the, the lower lands in Arcata. That water tank is being paid for in part by um, you know, grant funds, it's being paid for in part by uh, user fees, uh, and it's being paid in part by uh, development impact fees that we levied on recent projects that were, that were um, approved in the last, say, five years. And so we have a whole different type, a uh, whole suite of strategies for financing that. And we're in the process of doing the designs. And, you know, this is something that, again, we knew we were going to need when we adopted the general plan in 2000. So the difference between project implementation and plan development, you know, there's a, there's a wide gulf there. We do have to do enough environmental analysis on uh, these updates to ensure that we've uh, you know, adequately addressed and identified the mitigations that are required to offset any environmental impacts that will result from this planned growth. Um, and those would be identified and programmed into the plans ultimately. Um, but there's, there's a broad gulf between making a plan. Yes, we want to do this and then actually doing it. So I hope that helps. Yes, thank you very much. Thanks, Chair Mayor. Vice Chair Mayor. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and I'm I'm glad that this gateway process is going to be ongoing, that we've got nearly a year to be working on it, um, perhaps more. 
Um, and and I'd, I'd like to make a request, which is that we take advantage of the opportunity to link explicitly and directly any gateway plan to the local coastal program update. And I, I think that the concerns about infrastructure with regard to the sewage treatment plant, to the ability of soils to support large buildings, all of those things really point to the need um, to address decisions in these two plans in tandem um, and, and not to pretend that somehow um, we can work on one in, in one corner and the other in the other corner. Um, and secondly, and, and I, I've said this before in other contexts, but since Connie Stewart actually did speak up just now, um, I, I'd like to make a plea for the city and HSU to discuss um, mutual needs in the open um, in the context of this plan and to make sure that the public participation process um, in this planning effort um, and encapsulate and encourage an open and transparent approach um, by HSU with regard to the university's needs. Um, there, there are a number of places in the city where a previous lack of transparency and openness uh, have caused some serious problems. Um, and, and in this case, I think we have an opportunity to do it differently. And I'm super, super glad um, that Connie Stewart with all of your experience um, is going to be engaged in this process. Um, but I, the more upfront and transparent the city's interactions with HSU, HSU's interactions with the city on um, this one, um, can be the better off we're, we're going to be in developing this plan and others. So. Yeah, we've um, just to respond real quick, we've uh, definitely made an effort to engage uh, in particular HSU students um, through, you know, the planning efforts leading up through the housing element and the infill market study. Um, you know, we'll continue those efforts and certainly to the extent that the uh, university and the city council, the you know city manager's office, um, you know, uh, you know, develop those those uh, uh, co engagements, if you will. You know, we'd we'd certainly welcome that. Um, and just to the LCP, um, I do want to uh, let the planning commission know that we are absolutely working in tandem. You know, the ideas from one plan are um, you know being leveraged into the other, and the intent is ultimately that the portion of the gateway area plan, once it's adopted. Um, by the city that's in the coastal zone that will then be submitted again for a, a local coastal program update. So that'll be, um, you know, we'll have a couple of quick successive LCP updates, a comprehensive update from our 1989 plan uh, to revise uh, and, and get become consistent with our current zoning um, and current thinking. And then as soon as the, um, you know, and that's on, that's on uh, some grant deadlines as well uh, coming up in, in the early part of this year. And then as soon as we have the information or the, the adopted gateway area plan, we'll turn around and do a subsequent update to that comprehensive update to incorporate the, the gateway plan. So those planning efforts are definitely going on simultaneously and, and uh, informing one another. Commissioner Davies. Yes, I just wanted to say that one of the, one of the comments that I hear most regularly about the perceived impacts or anticipated impacts of the gateway project is the question about cars, which I find so baffling in some ways for a progressive city like Arcata. My understanding really is that the short answer is there's no way we could expand the population um, housing availability the way we need to and plan for everyone to have a car. It, is it not is it not accurate that the city's view on this is that not providing space for every new housing to have their own parking 
is going to be an important part of this and that it will drive um, it's a very um, it's very connected to uh, increasing the viability of public transport. Yeah, that's that's a great way to sum it up. Um, you know, first, I think a lot of people have heard us say this plan de-emphasizes you know parking, and they've translated into that into the city isn't providing any parking. The plan absolutely does uh, you know call for both on street and off street parking um, into the future. And so that'll be a component of it. It de-emphasizes though, it, it, it based on, again, the, the engagement that we've had, the direction we've received from council, um, you've hit the nail on the head, Commissioner Davies, that we're not intending to provide one parking space for every unit, um, recognizing that for every parking space that you're taking away some housing. And so there, that policy balancing, do we want to make sure that everybody has a a uh, free place to park, or do we want to make sure that there's places for people to live? The council and the commission has historically come down and we've created this plan based on uh, direction that we want to have places for people to live. Um, there are some creative ways that we can, you know, approach um, ensuring that there's uh, adequate or maybe even excessive parking. It might be uh, better use of land to have, you know, parking structure, for instance, and maybe that parking structure uh, can accommodate more parking than the on-site uses require. And in that way, that parking structure could help facilitate parking for, for other uses that are off-site. Um, because, you know, this plan is not going to eliminate parking um, or people using cars. Um, and if we did that and we said, look, in addition to, you know, you can subtract that from your height, for example. So, you know, if you're allowed a five-story building and you do three stories of, uh, you know, parking, then you would have an eight-story building and wouldn't, wouldn't count that as an eight-story building. We'd count it as a five and you'd be required to provide the amenities for a five-story building. That would be one way of, you know, tilting the balance, this policy balance back towards cars. If we said, hey, this is important for us to have cars. Now, again, there's another lever. Each of these different levers, you know, pulls in one direction or the other. People have said, you know, look, eight stories is just way too big for Arcata. It can't be done. And so to the extent that the community conversation leads us to the idea that we want to increase density, but we just don't want to increase it that much. You're going to reduce the amount of, you know, housing that you have and potentially the amount of parking that's available as well. Um, so these are all of the sort of po policy weigh weighing that we need to do. We've created a plan. This draft plan right now reflects, you know, our best interpretation of the public engagement to date. We're now in a process where we can get additional feedback on that. But you are absolutely right. This plan doesn't right now call for a one parking space per unit uh, provision. And in addition, beyond just making it so that, you know, parking may become a little bit less comfortable and maybe even problematic in the future, it goes beyond that and provides programs to ensure that there's, um, you know, infrastructure for, uh, you know, non-motorized transportation that's built into the project. Because without the infrastructure, you're not going to have the use of those non-motorized. It builds in, uh, you know, car share, bus share, other alternative modes of transportation programs to help support those those uh, uh, alternative modes come into our our region. Um, and so. You know, currently what we've done, our, our parking management strategy, like in the downtown, for example, where we have these exact same, currently under current code, we have the exact same provisions. If you build a unit, uh, a mixed use building, for example, with commercial on the ground floor and seven or fewer units on the top floor, you have to provide zero parking spaces currently in the existing code. The, the reasoning being that, you know, we're trying to move towards this alternative transportation and make parking difficult. That has some impact, it, you know, very, very minor, but it has some impact. If you go that step further, like we're doing in this plan and actually provide infrastructure and support for these other alternative transportation uh, pathways, then in the future, eventually we'll have, you know, robust, robust alternative transportation that will be uh, sufficient and convenient for some people, not everyone, but many people to be able to use as an alternative to having their own car. Yeah, I find that I, I just, I, I find the, the the focus on cars baffling, especially for a city like Arcata. Um, I would also like to, you know, take a little bit further the comments that Connie Stewart made, and I think 
it's important that if people want to come out and say that they're opposed to taller buildings in Arcata, that they should also be willing to say that they're for sprawl out into the green area around Arcata, because I simply don't see how we're possibly going to hit the kind of housing increase that we need without doing one or the other. And I think there's currently a place where it feels somewhat safe to say taller buildings are not, don't conform to people's vision of Arcata. But um, I think adopting that position um, implicitly sort of states that you're, you're, you're pro sprawling into the green areas around the city, which I also find kind of upsetting. Lastly, I want to um, echo um, Vice Chair Mayer's comments about um, creating some kind of transparency around communications between the city and the university. I think to the extent that um, either the city council, the planning commission, or um, equally importantly, the, the public in, uh, in general are aware of conversations, um, I think it can go a long way to sort of um, preventing some of these concerns from getting um, too far down the road um, when, when they can be addressed or people can have a, a, an idea of the kind of active conversations that are happening between the city and the university. I don't know if there's a specific group of representatives from the city and the university that are tasked with this kind of communication. Um, if so, I think um, I think transparency around what those communications are like. Um, I just want to echo that I think that could be really useful, save a lot of staff time from the city, save a lot of confusion on the part of the general public, and be just all around a uh, good investment in transparency. Thank you. Commissioner White. Um, yeah, I originally was going to say something, but I do want to also just piggyback on what um, Vice Mayor said and Commissioner Davies in that I feel like it's super important that we don't re uh, repeat the mistakes from past and that we really do make sure that we have open minds of communications and collaboration, um, whether it be like a stakeholder group, um, you know, with the key officials at the university, with the city. And then I guess my other question, or not question, but just an idea, and I'm sure that it's already been put out there, but maybe some kind of incentive, like if you leave your car at home, you get, you know, a break on your rent or some other kind of opportunities to encourage people to look at alternative transportation models as opposed to bringing their car. Yeah, one of the uh, programs that I'm not exactly sure how we, um, you know, impose this, and maybe it's not an imposition. The community benefits program, the way it's designed, um, is is somewhat elective. Um, but the, um, you know, right now, you know, parking is not um, doesn't have the kind of market that it does in other jurisdictions. San Francisco, you think of San Francisco, it's you have to pay to park in San Francisco, even if you have a, a house, you know, or, or an apartment or whatever uh, in San Francisco proper. Chances are good that you're paying for a space if you want one. And so decoupling the rent from the parking is a way to do that. And we've, we've definitely got that embedded as, a, as an option. I have a few comments. Um, uh, definitely Ann King-Smith. I really miss having her on the commission with us. She was wonderful. Uh, everything that she said really needs to be looked into. And then as far as my opinion is, um, it, it seems there were never really any other options than the multi-story buildings. Um, and to me, they, a, a person that walks through the city of Arcata probably every single day, twice today, because the sun was out, um, it blocks the sunlight from the houses, it blocks the green spaces, it's, it, there's a lot of noise and echoing um, all the shade, which is terrible this time of year. It's freezing when you have buildings on either side of you. Uh, I'm, I'm just not crazy about the vast multi-story housing. Um, it's just like this was the original plan and all along and despite public input, it just has never changed. It's always been the same. So I'm not crazy about this plan, but I, I understand logically. I, I do, I really get it. You know, you don't always get what you want, but um, I don't like these huge multi-story buildings. It's too cold during the winter and moldy and it's like, ugh, just, too much shade for me. 
So that's one thing. Then the other thing is, um, we were talking about um, transportation and the buses. I never ride the bus, but I have a disabled daughter who 100% rides the bus. That's all she does is ride, ride the bus. And they are not, our, our bus hubs are not coordinated. Like her uh, worker can uh, ride somewhere on one of them for free, but the next one they have to pay. It would be really nice if they could get, all get coordinated and you can buy one bus pass that'll take you from here to Fortuna. It's a mess and, and sh she can't figure it out. And I, we have to help her. And if she can't figure it out, a lot of people can't figure it out. So um, our, our transportation could be a lot better um, in my opinion. And then as far as working with HSU, we really need to work with HSU. No, everything needs to be transparent. Um, I, I grew up here in Arcata. I benefited my whole life from uh, having HSU here. I mean, just, they're just wonderful from anyway, but we need to really um, work together as a team because it, it hasn't been that way. That whole village thing was really caused a lot of conflict and it didn't need to be that way. And, um, yeah, we really need to work with HSU a little bit more and be a little more transparent, open, and be, be a team. So that's my opinion. Does anyone else have anything else to say on this subject? No? Oh, okay, Commissioner White? Well, I guess I did ride the bus for some time because I wanted to see how efficient our bus service was. and. I concur, we can do better. I think that if we do that, um, people are more likely to ride the bus. I know that we've talked about making buses free at one point, and I know that that would be quite costly. There are match grants out there. And then the other thing is that my daughter's father is legally blind, so he has no choice but to ride the buses. And it's been a big hardship for him in trying to navigate it. And, you know, he has an MBA, so, you know, it's not like, it, yeah, just putting that out there that um, your daughter's not the only one who has difficulty navigating the bus system. Commissioner Barstow? Yeah, one of the programs. Sorry, go ahead. I just wanted to highlight because the <clears throat> conversation around the buses uh, that we do have a program um, in the plan that uh, essentially allows for a bus pass program, similar to what we did on Sorrel Place, where each of the units gets a, a bus pass. Kind of the idea being that, you know, right now the supply is so low that there's no demand. It's, you know, more difficult to ride the bus. If you, if you don't absolutely have to ride the bus, you're probably not going to. Um, but with this program, it'll help fund more busing and then eventually we'll have the supply. So we can build, build supply before the demand and then the demand will, will grow with that um, because uh, jumping on a bus will be easier than than taking your car. That's kind of the the vision there. And and to your comments, Commissioner uh, Chair Bassett Elcock, um, we absolutely have been in conversations uh, with the HTA trying to get a more integrated across system uh, platform because you're right, it's just the hodgepodge of bus services just doesn't work effectively together right now. Commissioner Barstow. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to point out a couple things. Um, when we look at the plan and, and see the, the uh, huge amount of uh, prospective development that's included, uh, there's a tendency to, to say, wow, this is way too much. This is horrible. But the thing is, what, what's being created is a template for development it's not development. The development won't be done by the city. The development will be done by individual uh, developers who invest their own money in, in uh, building needed buildings. Because they're investing their own money, they aren't gonna build buildings if there's no demand for them. So what we're looking at is a very long range plan that may never be fully built out uh, because it's going to depend on voluntary actions by uh, private uh, property owners. Uh, and I, did, I did just want to point out for perspective, when, the, when I landed here in Arcata in 1976, the population was around 8,000. Uh, today, it's around 18,000. 
And so we can look around and say, well, this happened. You know, there's a, that's a huge increase. So I just want to suggest that going forward, uh, the, the increase in population will be incremental and not happen all at once. Uh, and as we go along, all the questions about the infrastructure uh, and traffic and parking and so on will have to be answered uh, for each project as it comes up. So anyway, I, I, you know, I, I think we uh, just need to keep uh, pushing ahead and, and refining this project, but knowing that it's a long, long term uh, plan and it's not going to happen suddenly. Very good. Thank you. So do we want to move on to the next business item? Yeah, I will just let you know that there is, I know you closed the public comment portion, but I think there's one more person that's raised their hand. Um, if you wish to let them in, there may be others that raise their hand as well. So just, it's up It's up to you to um, why we're direct here. me on that. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Cindy. Um, Cindy, I, I don't think we can hear you <laughs> properly. Do you want to try and um, maybe move closer to the microphone? Or maybe hang up and call back real quick. Is this better? Oh, yes. That's much better. <laughs> Did I sound like Mickey Mouse? Yeah. I, wish, I wish I could play back for you what we heard. <laughs> it's funny. I have to change. Oh. I have to change it all back and forth. Anyway, I just want to say that um, I do a lot of, um, I live in Arcata. I, I commute mostly 99% of the time on foot or bike. And so I just want to comment on public transportation of, I love how your plan, you know, sets up people to move around Arcata. But if you try and leave Arcata, that is, um, I'm hopeful that there's more lobbying with other communities. I mean, if you trying to get better um, transportation, because if you try and go to San Francisco, the Greyhound bus dumps you off on a sidewalk at 10 o'clock at night. They used to have a, have a transportation center that you could go to, but they closed that. Um, if you try and go to Reading to catch the train, the train leaves at three in the morning. Um, uh, if you try and go to Crescent City, there's only one bus going up there. You know, is there a way to get the Greyhound to go farther now instead of stopping in Arcata? I've traveled a lot by public transportation from this area, and it's just really, really difficult. And so trying to keep the cars down from people who are going to want to leave the area and not have to depend on the public transportation. Because I'm, you know, as other people are I'm concerned about where will these cars go? If there's no public park, you know, if there's no parking with this project, you know, is it going to, are they going to park, you know, two blocks away, leave their car until they need to go down the Bay Area, which is affecting, you know, the residences who live in, in the area that are going to be impacted by cars. So um, I'm hoping that there's going to be a bigger, bigger view on um, public transportation beyond just the Arcata borders. Thank, Thank you. you. There's someone else, David? I don't see anyone else at this time. Okay, so let's move on to planning commission and training. Uh, I'm excited to hear about planning commission training, some training classes for us. Um, so this item, I'll, I'll just queue up and then I'll, I'll turn over to Vice Chair Mayor. Uh, this, this item was originally requested by uh, the Vice Chair in relation to a couple of procedural things that had come up and also just to, to ensure that we had a conversation around, um, you know, the process. We have a lot of new planning commissioners. We've done some orientation, but I think it was just called for as an opportunity to, to talk through some procedural issues and, and then make a call for, you know, some additional training. So. Um, Vice Chair Mayor, if I could 
maybe turn the floor over to you and you can kick off the conversation. And I, th I think we can have just sort of a, you know, open uh, ranging conversation about uh, these items. Oh, I will mention too that I did send to you this evening a couple of resources related to this uh, this topic, just as a refresher for for some pr protocol and procedural things. Hi. Um, yeah. Thank thank you, um, Community Development Director Loya. Um, I didn't realize that I would be um, speaking at this meeting about this, but I I did kind of have have a list of things that motivated a request to have this on the agenda. Um, you mentioned training um, and and maybe to start off with there. Um, in the past, the city has budgeted for specific types of training and then done training for um, city staff, commission members, council members, um, kind of all together with an occasional event that people could attend. Um, interestingly enough, as we've moved to a virtual world, that's also opened up a lot of opportunities for people to um, seek training that's, that's more specific to what they need to learn. And right now, because we have um, a fairly new set of planning commissioners and a very new set of um, city council members, um, it, it does seem like we're in a position to seek opportunities for all of us to um, get some training that we specifically need um, as a commission, but also as individuals. Um, we're all coming from different places with different sets of skills and experience. Um, for for several years, we've we've all had CEQA training at various points. We've had training with regard to historic resources. We've had a number of different opportunities, all of us together. Um, right now, and I think over the next year, we're not looking at events where a group of people will physically get together in a very large room and, and um, get training by some outside source. There are a number of online and virtual and um, web-based training resources that I would love the city to be able to benefit from. Um, the planning commission, um, city staff, and members of other committees, as well as the city council. Um, one of them is the Planetizen training um, base. It's a subscription-based service, which I've I've um, kind of pointed out to various staff members as a resource over a few years. Um, it's not super cheap, but it's also a great bargain. And I'd, I'd, I'd love for the city to make that available to commissioners. There are also a number of organizations that the city um, is a member of with their own training resources. If there's a way to extend those to planning commissioners, that would be terrific. Um, the Institute for Local Government is one of those. <clears throat> and there's also a possibility of training through um, the Association of Environmental Professionals, the American Planning Association. Um, so while we're still doing um, some budgeting with the city council, it would be terrific to see those opportunities um, made available, not just to the planning commission, but to city staff and um, the city council and members of other committees as well. Um, so that that was that was one of the the training issues that I wanted to bring up. Um, a second one has to do with the protocols that um, the city council adopted years ago um, and has been renewing 
um, every couple of years or revising or at least reviewing every couple of years. And it has to do with, among other things, what planning commission members um, need to think about in interacting with other city bodies. And um, some of those things came about as a result of um, bad decision making or problematic decision making um, by some individuals, which resulted in uh, problems for the commission as a whole. Um, but it would be great to have an opportunity to review those expectations and to talk about them um, with the planning commission. And if there are changes that we'd like to recommend, um, that might be an opportunity to do that as well. Um, and the third thing that, that came up, um, and this also has to do with potential conflicts of interest and introduction of bias, had to do with the degree of um, detail that was in the minutes. And I know that city staff has sort of looked at um, how to make the minutes both clear, but also really consistent um, between issues across time um, and from one meeting to the next. Um, so that, that was, kind of the, the reason that I put in a request that we should um, talk about the protocol and training issues um, conveniently on the same day that we're gonna be talking about the Planning Commission's report to the City Council. Thank you, Commissioner White, do you have a question? Um, comment if I'm allowed um, I agree or I got real excited when I saw the training um, because I feel like um, I know I could still use some I used my own funding and took local government planning I own um, the California um, book that Judith had recommended to the Planning Commission as well as the planners and I'm also a member of the APA planning um, and I've done a Brown Act um, workshop. And honestly, I still feel like I need more. Um, and I feel like if we have the new city council, um, they're certainly going to want these resources as well. And I think it's been a while, if I'm not mistaken, since there has been a uh, formal or official training or workshop that has um, occurred for the commission and possibly even the city council. I, I think the city council has had some actually, but um, I don't think we have for some time, at least not since I've been here. Yeah, for the for the training, um, we've definitely had a couple of lean years, uh, lean bu budget years where uh, previously, as Vice Chair Mayor pointed out, we used to have a budget, a regular budget, and we'd you know, do at least the um, the Environmental Planners Association's uh, uh, annual update to CEQA uh, and everyone, all the planning commissioners would go to that, staff would go to that. Um, those got axed from our budget a number of years ago and we had a couple of lean years and we just really truly have not uh, you know, gotten back on our feet. Uh, last year, the planning commission included in their uh, their annual report to the, to the city council that they wanted to have a training budget uh, allocated um, this is an overlap to the next item, but it's also included in your uh, current uh, year for the uh, for the end report. And you can certainly make you know more specific requests um, into that if you wish, or if you want to just work with me offline and have specific requests as to you know budget items, and we can use those to help build the budget recommended budget. Um, I can't recall if we gave up last year, and Jen, maybe you can help remind me if we put in a budget for planning uh, commission training and then ultimately that got axed or if we just didn't even try last year because we knew how bad it was going to be but you know we can certainly in the all budget of our, session in the but sorry all of our training actually was I, I believe we didn't end up with any training for staff or or 
any of our committees or commissions. Okay. Um, so we, we can definitely address that. Um, I did just want to share because I'd mentioned that I sent these resources um, to you. I wanted to share with the public what the resources were. Um, the City Council Protocol Manual, which was uh, adopted most recently, readopted in 2018 as a biennial review. Um, so um, I believe it was actually most recently adopted in 2020. Uh, I'll have to verify that. But this is what's up on our website right now. And I believe, uh, Vice Chair Mayor, this was the document you were referring to that has some discussion around uh, interactions between, uh, you know, the commissions, boards, and communities and task force. And so this is this is a great resource for you to kind of read through. It's really directed at City Council's protocol manual, but a lot of it really is applicable to other boards and commissions. Um, the other document that I shared with you is uh, the League of Cities Open and Public. This is one of a series of documents, and they've just pr produced these really uh, succinct, easy to understand, plain language uh, descriptions. This one's on uh, the Brown Act. Um, and so this would be good for you to, to review. Uh, it talks about, you know, good public process. And then lastly, I provided you this, uh, the Planning Commissioner's role, um, which covers a range of topics. And again, this is by the, um, I believe this is an ILG production, uh, oh, League of California Cities, excuse me, uh, as well. Um, and, you know, this, this range of topics, I mean, it really is, you know, again, these are, you know, fairly short documents is only 11 pages long. It has real succinct nuggets that you can, um, you know, really uh, wrap your mind around easily. We did have a, a training and in-house training with this document um, within the last two years, but it's worth revisiting. So if there's anything in any of these documents that you wanted to dig into now, you know, uh, Vice Chair Mayor uh, put forward the concept of maybe digging into this uh, a little bit, the protocol manual. Um, but if there's anything that you wanted to go into in any of those other documents, happy to give an overview or just jump into specific topics as well. Um, perhaps that could be for another meeting. I haven't had time to dive into everything, but probably after we read it, we'll have some questions for you or Judith. Okay. Are there all right, are we ready to move on to the next business item? Planning Commission's annual report. Yeah, so on this item, just again, I'll key it up real quick and then it's, you know, off, you know, off to the discussion. So I prepared the annual report draft uh, that's in your packet before you tonight. And um, it certainly should be considered just a working draft. If the planning commission wants to adopt it just as is, feel free. It's ready to go, I believe. Um, if there are changes you wanna make, that's certainly your prerogative. Um, ultimately, what you will do is adopt this as your um, uh, annual report for last year. And then uh, typically the chair uh, presents that to the city council um, and the scheduled date for that is the 19th. So next, next city council meeting uh, to provide that to the, the city council. If for whatever reason you can't make a, a final decision on it tonight, we can always move that date. Um, and certainly if the 19th doesn't work for the chair, you can appoint uh, anyone else on the, on the commission, probably starting with the vice chair to, to present that to the council. Has the commission had a chance to review this? Is there any additions or um, subtractions? It looks like Dan has something he's trying to say, but he's muted. <laughs> no, Dan, do you have something to say? Or yes or no? Do you know sign language? I can't, still can't hear you. You're still muted. Okay. Can you hear me now? Commissioner Tagney, did you have a comment about the annual report? No. No, okay. Sorry, so, I was unmuted and I didn't have a video there for a minute. I'm back. Uh, I have no questions. Um, 
So if we don't have anything to add to this, you're looking for a motion to approve this as uh, our goals for 2022, is that correct? Add or subtract? Yes. Yep. Okay. Right. To me, they look great. So this is the report for um, 2021. Correct. And, and then, then our goals uh, for 2022, right? Okay, I see. Correct. All right, do we have a motion to approve the um, annual report and annual goals? I would make that motion. I would a motion to approve our uh, planning commission goals for 2022. So we have a motion from Commissioner Tagney. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. We have a second. We have a second. Vice, Vice Chair Mayor recorded in the record as second. Okay. All in favor? Oh, I'm sorry. Do we have a um, uh, roll call vote? Roll call, please. <laughs> Commissioner Davies? Aye. Commissioner Barstow? Aye. Commissioner White? Aye. Commissioner Tagney? Aye. Vice Chair Mayor? Aye. And Chair Vesade Alcock? Aye. Okay, motion approved. Uh, do we have any correspondence or communications? I'd like to ask one question of staff. And I should have asked this earlier while we were talking about the um, gateway project, but with the uh, cumul uh, cumul um, all the community meetings that are going to be uh, taking place and including things like our planning commission meeting with community input, um, are you, is there some kind of tally system or something? I mean, I hear you say you're trying to collect all this public input. Are you taking notes like, oh, here's another person concerned about traffic or bicycle parking or whatever? Um, how does this all come together into some kind of thing that we can process later? Um, I do recall in the past um, on a couple of projects where there were downtown meetings that people put stickers and then we actually counted how many green stickers were on each topic. Um, anyway, there's my question. That's a great question. And and again, you know, we can't because of its uh, correspondence and communications, we can't go into too much detail. But part of what I wanted to convey to the uh, Planning Commission was, you know, again, just reiterating some of the upcoming events for our um, our gateway plan and, and the general plan. Um, and I, I do want to acknowledge that we've been having that same question and discussing at the staff level, uh, you know, between uh, uh, our, you know, our team between uh, senior planner Dilo Freitas and, and our deputy director Dart that, you know, we really need to come up with a cohesive um, explanation to the community about how the uh, input is being taken in, how it's being, you know, digested and how it's going to be conveyed. Um, and it really, it's, it spans the gambit. We're doing so many different kinds of engagements um, that there's not one answer. So, you know, the uh, on the 21st and 22nd at the Arcata Community Center, we're going to hold an open house. There's going to be a whole lot of uh, self-guided uh, materials that include things like sticky dots where the community can come and tell the you know, commission, the city council, exactly how they feel about building height, about you know, the road design, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we're also tabling that week and we're going to have conversations with people and we're recording you know, and, and making mental note of the themes that are coming up and we'll convey that information. So there's really two different kinds of, of you know, information in just those two events that are happening on that exact same day. Uh, but to your question, yes, I, I wrote down the topics that came up, the questions that were asked, the detailed, um, I, I put check marks when somebody else said, hey, I wanna double down on that comment so that we're getting a sense for in these meetings, you know, what are the important issues to people? We're trying to be responsive to those as well and include them in the uh, frequently asked questions that we provide on our, our website so that people can get instant access to information about the, um, you know, the questions. Um, so it really ranges, you know, it depends on the kind of event we're doing. It depends on the type of engagement that we're doing and the type of information that we're, we're collecting, how we will convey that to the city council. The themes that we're picking up, for example, on the, um, on the tours, the walking tours, I'm not carrying a pad and paper and recording words on, you know, that people are saying I'm, taking it in, I'm digesting and I'm making mental notes and making sure that we're being responsive to that. I can convey that 
Um, you know, and then we also have some more data that's a little bit more granular. We have, we're, we're going to develop a survey uh, that will get into demographic information, you know, who's in the room, who are we outreach and engaged to. Um, so there's, there's just a, a really broad uh, range of engagements we do, and we get a lot of different kinds of data back, and we'll provide that uh, in many different ways, but ultimately in a, a report to the council that ultimately says, you know, th these, these are the themes we heard, here's the data we collected, this is the summary of it. Thank you. Any Absolutely. Other? So, yeah. Anything else? Just wanted to reiterate 21st and 22nd, we're going to have an open house. Please uh, come, tell your neighbors, tell a friend. Um, everybody's got a right to be grooving. All right, meeting that, is adjourned. Oh, I'm sorry. That, that one's in person at the community center, is that correct? In person at the community center, we're going to limit, uh, it's, it spans over several hours on each day. And so we're going to limit the number of people who are allowed in the event at any one time. There's no specific presentation time, but there's self-guided materials. We're going to be re replaying the um, hour-long presentation of the description of the gateway plan. Uh, we're likely going to have the very short description of what, what the SERP is, the Strategic Infill Redevelopment Program. Uh, we have a, a little video on that. Um, and then we'll have workstations where people can go and, you know, it'll either be a, a sticky dot or a post-it note, write your thoughts on a post-it note, stick it on the, on the uh, map, that sort of thing, so that people can engage specifically with materials. That will be, you know, conveying in, in a summary, you know, 50% of the people said this or 70% of the people said that. Um, and we're really excited about that because a lot of people have said, you know, we need to have something in person. So this is an opportunity for them to come and, and talk with a staff member. And that's January 21st and 22nd, correct? January 21, 22. And commissioners Two are day welcome. event. Commissioners are welcome. Yeah, the community is welcome. Um, yeah, I'd love to have people come down. It's not a, a planning commission meeting, so we'll probably try and, uh, you know, uh, limit conversations between the two of you so we don't have a Brown Act violation. Read the uh, packet that I sent you today. <laughs> All right. Okay, meeting is adjourned. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank Bye. You. Thanks, Thank everybody. You.